Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is for you. We'd like to welcome you to the Compute Everywhere with the wonderful subtitle of How Storage and Networking Expand the Compute Continuum. This is a presentation of the Storage and Networking Industry Association Compute Memory Storage Initiative. And uh, my name is Jim Fister. I will be your moderator for today. Uh, let me give you a little bit of uh, guideline around the uh, around the platform here, so that if you're not familiar with BrightTalk, uh, it should be at the bottom of the presentation screen. You should see some options. One of those would be to expand to full screen. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, in-depth charts that people might go through, uh, and so you might want to expand if you want. There is a question already, is the presentation available later? We have made the presentation available on the SNEA Educational Library. So if you go to SNEA.org uh, and uh, click on the Educational Library, you can find the Bright Talk slides there. So uh, we hope that that uh, helps, and uh, I'll, I'll answer that again later as well. We will also be providing a post Bright Talks Q&A blog at the SNEA.org uh, SNEA blog, and you'll be able to find it there where we'll answer some of the questions and summarize some of the conversation here. So let me introduce the uh, speakers today. So as I said, my name is Jim Fister. I'm the moderator. I'm an independent contractor for SNEA, and I run my own company, The Decision Place. We also have uh, Ellie Tiomkin. Say hi, Ellie. Hey, Jim. Uh, thanks for having us. All right. Ellie is with NGD Systems. He'll be uh, sp speaking as a startup and the uh, sharp end of the spear uh, in terms of implementing some of this stuff. Uh, we also have Steve Adams. So he's, the, he's a strategist from Intel and are in the networking group. Say hi, Steve. Good morning and good afternoon. Glad to be here. And from Microsoft, Principal Program Manager and uh, Lead, uh, we have Chipolo Street. Say hi, Chipolo. Hey, everyone. All right. So let me set the context a little bit on, uh, what, uh, on what we're going to do. But first, let me uh, cover a few things. Uh, unless uh, somebody surprises me, uh, none of us are lawyers here. Uh, the material contained in this presentation is copyrighted by SNEA, but none of this constitutes uh, legal advice. So uh, you may use this material in your presentations uh, and uh, under certain conditions if you're a SNEA member. Uh, this is a project of the Storage Networking Industry Association. And uh, like I already said, uh, none of us are lawyers. None of this should be constituted as legal advice. And this represents our personal opinions. And uh, you know, obviously, we're representing uh, various companies and organizations, but we're talking as individuals. So um, SNEA, if you're not familiar with it, uh, is composed of 185 industry-leading organizations. We have over 2,000 active contributing members, and we reach to over 50,000 IT end users, storage professionals worldwide. So we have a wide reach, and we certainly are glad that you are uh, attending today uh, and or viewing this recording afterward. Let's talk a, bit, a little bit about compute and, and about data. Um, uh, I made a variation of this slide. Actually, uh, I don't know whether I made it or Beth Clare made it, but I remember uh, uh, many years ago uh, at Intel, we we came up with a very simple paradigm for enterprise data states. Uh, and uh, we basically said you can do a variety of things with data and you can utilize it in various forms. But uh, to a large degree, it came down to at some point you want to analyze it, and so you would move the data to a compute node. So the data would be there and, and could be done in analytics. Or you could move or transfer that data. Yeah, it would be data in flight. Or you could, once you'd done some transform on that data, you could store or archive it. And we viewed these as traditional enterprise data states. But we've seen over the intervening years that that's really collapsing. So you still do see the large compute nodes, but the, the network itself and the storage and the archive itself are really starting to become compute functions themselves. Some of this can be a, a variety of different reasons. Uh, one, your data could be so large that you have to move the compute to the store uh, rather, than the, rather than take the stored data and move it to the compute node. Or some of it could be the uh, need for response. And so the data in flight might tell you enough to make a decision, and latency is going to matter in some areas. So 
I could talk about it, but I'm not the expert. Let me hand it over to the experts. Uh, first, I'm going to hand it over to Steve. So, Steve, you can have the comm and uh, talk a little bit about uh, compute from the Intel perspective, especially from the Intel network perspective. Thank you, uh, Jim. I've been in the industry, I shocked myself when I thought about it, coming up on 40 years. And uh, I've, I've seen this pendulum play out a couple of times where the pendulum of compute, which seems to, you know, wherever compute goes, storage follows and networking expands to accommodate. And we're seeing, you know, kind of some reverse action into that. But I've seen it swing back and forth between distributed architectures. You could say that the original PC was a highly distributed architecture, you know, uh, in um, opposition or, or in contrast to the mainframes of the time. And what we're seeing today is between these highly distributed and highly centralized and, uh, compute architectures, there's a certain attributes that are being considered. You know, on the centralized side, you've got a, a global reach. Uh, data is coming in from everywhere. Applications are available to anyone. It's available anytime, all time, et cetera. And many of the decisions that are being made, you know, as far as, you know, because of the inherent latency of long haul networks, et cetera, tend to be more human time decisions between the users and the compute infrastructure in the cloud or a highly centralized data center. What happens inside the data center is a whole different story. On the opposite end, you've got a highly distributed environment where, you know, of course, that's where the physical world is sensed and measured. It's also where the mechanical world exists, where the machines uh, that build, uh, you know, uh, the robots that build things and uh, the sprinklers that water things and building automation systems, et cetera. And what we see is, is this flow of, of, of compute store and move capability swinging back and forth between these two extremes. And Jim alluded to some of this in, in that, you know, part of what motivates some, you know, the, the compute to happen closer to the physical thing is, you know, latency. Uh, sometimes it's the, the cost of moving it, as he referred to. Sometimes it's also the resiliency or the lack of confidence that, uh, you know, if you put your compute off premises or too far away, it may not uh, be available. Although that's being challenged in many cases, we're seeing that, uh, you know, there's a higher confidence level in, in some of the compute that happens in data centers uh, and the redundancy techniques that are deployed there. Again, pushing this pendulum to swing back and forth. Another thing that kind of pushes things around is regulation or data sovereignty or privacy concerns. You know, you want the, in some cases, you have to keep the, the data geofenced or located in, in a particular region in the world. And the other, you know, a reality is, is that some workloads uh, require much more uh, compute store and move capacity than others, and there's nothing quite as... Um, you know, capable as, as the cloud as far as representing almost a infinite storage and, and compute capacity. But what we're seeing, oops, got to hit the right button. What we're also seeing, though, is, is that there's kind of a battle going on. And the battleground of this next decade, I suggest, is around edge computing. And edge computing, you know, um, materializes in three main locations. And, uh, uh, and that one location is on premises. Uh, sure, there's some edge computing that occurs in the things, you know, the, the, the robot, the PC, the printer, the heating and air conditioning system, et cetera. But I'm more referring to the, the, the compute that happens as that data from all of those things aggregate. And the first place that they aggregate is on premises. The other place that the, you know, the, the data uh, is aggregating is in the network, whether that's you know, like at a base station or uh, aggregating further back into the network and central offices or in metro uh, data centers like uh, co-location data centers. 
or even within larger metro areas, you see the the emergence of of zones, which my colleague from my um, from Microsoft will talk more about. Um, and why this is a battle a battleground for um, the sharing economy is because you know as the cloud has proved to industries over and over again that there is value in operational efficiency savings in ca capital expense savings in the sharing economy and when uh, the infrastructure is deployed on premises and it only um, serves one tenant that enterprise uh, or campus that, that you know where that equipment is deployed then the sharing economy is limited to the valuable resource of shared skilled labor whereas when you move off premises the in, the the increase in tenancy or to you know the evolution to more multi-tenant environments so that you're not only sharing the skilled labor of an ecosystem but you're sharing the compute and storage resources and it's that that ability to share which actually is what is anticipated to drive efficiency into the uh, the edge and give it the reason or, or provide the motivation for enterprises who are yet to move some of their compute off premises to uh, to to you know aggregation points such as in the metro area or zones or hyperscale data center it's all going to be because of this ability to share what is increasingly come very sophisticated skilled labor not just from managing the operations of infrastructure but also you know as more and more uh, enterprise customers especially IOT enterprises realize that they want the value of extracting uh, uh, insights out of their data that they can use to automate their systems and reduce the errors and the quality issues or even the amount of overhead and personnel required uh, to uh, you know operate a factory a building a transportation system etc and so we see this emergence of AI everywhere, and wherever you know AI is, in in my mind, is kind of the uh, silver bullet or the killer app for edge computing, and it represents you know manifests in a bunch of different ways, whether it's you know inference, uh, sophisticated or simple, or inference and grooming, where the infrastructure actually participates in preparing the data to be more easily ingested and, uh, and queried at the next tier or peer of, of uh, data processing. Bottom line is, this is the battleground. And when I say battleground, it, it's, it's because it's both a compute, uh, you know, uh, target rich area for innovation. And it's also a battleground because it is highly distributed, meaning there's a physical location aspect to the edge. And it's um, very difficult for a single entity, a single company or service provider or enterprise to own you know, a worldwide global footprint when you're measuring your edge instances in the tens of thousands or millions of locations. Just to give you an insight, like in that metro area, there's, um, you know, around the, around the world there are about 140 to 150,000 central offices owned by comm service providers like AT&T or Deutsche Telekom. There's about, you know, seven to nine million outdoor base station locations, some of which are being converted into little MIDI data centers or sharing the same electricity and cooling in those huts that we see as we drive around. And, you know, that's a, just a massive amount of footprint of physical locations, even though within each individual location it's a much smaller or, you know, fewer racks or half racks of, of compute store and move resources compared to what you'd find in a, in a regional or a zone data center, let alone a hyperscale data center. But it's just that sheer uh, footprint size that is actually the interesting question of who is going to own and be the market leaders. 
Now, to kind of answer that question or at least give a uh, set up a discussion for it, I look at the, uh, the way the edge is building out in three phases. And to use an, an uncommon phrase at this point, maybe you guys will help me make it common, is I believe that what we're seeing with edge computing is the rise of an edge data network. Right now in phase one, most of the edge deployments, whether it's on-prem or nearby in a colo site or you know, at a comm service provider uh, network location, is usually targeted at one or a few customers per site um, and targeted to solve some specific problems. Now this makes perfect sense when you're dealing with a transition of an industry like what edge computing can uh, represent is because you know you got to go solve a real problem in order to get paid. And so we're seeing what I think is classified as phase one where we have islands of edge compute. Phase two in my mind, is where we actually see the more realization of the vision of edge computing, where all those islands actually become a network of edges. And when you think about the massive footprint that a, net, a, you know, a, a network of edges represents, then you begin to see that if you were to step back and think of that as a coordinated asymmetrical computer, it's a computer, you know, that is on the size of a couple of hyperscale data centers. And when you start talking magnitudes of compute and move and store resources and the software businesses that go along with it and the infra management services and the platform as a service businesses that go along with that, that's what makes the edge such a financially appealing situation. And it really is going to boil down to what I refer to as phase three is where those network of edges become a on-demand composable end-to-end -end platform. And we're already seeing a transition you know, in the way uh, developers write applications or, uh, or create services to be really simplified down to doing scripts with the right, you know, the scripting languages and doing queries against active data. And the, the vision in my mind is is that you know over the next decade we will see you know a script or a data query actually invoke a, a the composition of an end to end platform that may consist of you know resources in the uh, metro zone on prem in the you know a regional cloud as well as the hyperscale centralized clouds. And the next script from a different tenant or a different customer will create another version of that hyper-distributed and composable system. And that that system will exist to solve that customer's problem for as long as it's needed and execute wherever it's needed in order to meet the QoS SLAs or data sovereignty rules or latency uh, and determinism responsibilities, but will be very much part of this sharing economy, meaning ultimately I envision a time where, you know, resource owners, whether they're somebody, you know, like a colo site uh, like Equinix has their, what I call it, uh, uh, something bare metal services, or Azure's, you know, a varying IoT edge uh, uh, resource pools, uh, you know, deployed on-prem or in the network or uh, in zones, uh, that these kinds of resources will e exist with many different owners who will lend them kind of like Airbnb allows a homeowner to lend a couch, uh, a bedroom, or the whole house to participate in these composable systems. So let me stop that's a, there. That's, a, that's really interesting, Steve. I mean, because the overlay of policy, I think, is the, is the real key to enabling a lot of this. It, would, it, it gives you the ability to say, I'm going to apply a network rule or I'm going to apply a, or I'm going to apply a rule to a given node um, that I can share across all these various distributed pieces and let them, let them come together. Is, is, did I get that correct? 
Yeah, and, you know, there's different kinds of apps. You know, if you think in broad categories, there's IT apps, and they're sort of scattered already. Uh, some of them, you know, usually if it can be done in the cloud or the centralized cloud, it will be because that's usually the most efficient or cheapest place to do it, especially if you have a global reach demand. But then there's the communication and the CT apps, you know, things like, uh, you know, CDN, uh, content distribution networks. There's your, your telephony and video conferencing apps. Those are the kinds of things that have a little more real-time emphasis on them, and they tend to live more uh, scattered between, you know, the endpoint and, and the cloud. And then you have your OT applications, you know, things like building automation systems or factory automation systems where latency and jitter considerations are so tight that much of the application, not all of it, but much of the application either has to run on-prem or very nearby. Now, to your point, in order to make this work in, a, in an eventual world where you're sharing resources between multiple owners, whether that resource is a hardware resource or a software resource or a set of algorithms or you know a, a, a inference engine, is going to require a whole new level of of trust to be established, and that trust is going to be a combination of security as well as things like you know, the distributed ledger technology for measuring and, uh, you know, the, the transactions that occur to make sure people get paid. It's going to be, you know, uh, have, have to have stronger uh, attestation and authentication capabilities of people, of things, of software, of stacks, of hardware, et cetera. It's a target-rich mm -hmm. environment for innovation. Yeah, absolutely. It's, there's, a, there's a good question that came in from the audience, and I'd certainly encourage all of you in the audience to feel free to submit questions uh, whenever they arise. Um, but this is actually a good transition question. It's actually more a comment. There are app silos and app dependencies, you know, multi-tier apps that make it difficult to move away from a centralized or consolidated IT design. You know, the, the fact that all apps run on the main data center and the, and the rest really go to a client side. But I think there's an aspect of right once run everywhere, and I, and I know I'm simplifying things, Chip, a little, a little bit, but why don't we hand it over to you and talk a little bit about um, about what the Azure Stack does and how that moves across some of these various uh, areas like Steve's talking about. Yeah, definitely. Um, as I talk to customers, one of the main questions I get asked is, how is edge computing different than traditional on-prem? I think one of the key points from Steve's comments is that these new capabilities um, previously only accessible in the centralized cloud are becoming available to on-prem devices. So these capabilities vary from anything from remote management to shared data to new forms of compute like AI and machine learning. And when these capabilities are used together, customers can begin a process of digital transformation. This often starts with accomplishing new scenarios. However, it quickly bleeds into adjacent areas like logistics improvements or maybe like supply chain optimization. What I love about the paradigm of digital transformation is that transformation starts with the existing state. And as one goes through a transformation, you move from where you are currently to where you want to be. And customers are all over the map currently with the types of edge compute they run today. And this is really driven by the scenarios that they're accomplishing. Um, Azure embraces this diversity by providing the most comprehensive edge portfolio of any vendor. This allows us to meet the customer where they are today and grow with them on their journey of digital transformation. So for example, if you need the, hyper, the hyperscale cloud, we provide Azure. Um, we offer products like Azure Stack Hub or Azure Stack Edge or Azure Stack HCI for customers who fall into the zone or metro classification mentioned in previous slides. Azure IoT Edge, the product I lead, is usable for on-prem edge. And then Azure Sphere, Azure RTOS, or the Azure IoT Device SDK can be used for on-prem things. This portfolio provides types of flexibilities for devices above and beyond sort of the obvious hardware sizing. For example, some of these offerings are hardware as a service. Some of them are kept up to date on behalf of the customer by Microsoft, and then like others, um, for example, the SDKs can be used to build products that run on practically any type of hardware a customer solution requires. 
Importantly, this wave of edge computing is more than the evolution of physical devices. Azure's Edge portfolio integrates with control planes that can run in the cloud or on the edge when devices are disconnected. Um, and it allows high-value cloud workloads to break free from the cloud and run locally. These capabilities are designed to meet the customer where they are today. For example, customers who have high computing needs can both train and inference AI models on the edge, while customers who have smaller edge devices can train the AI models in the cloud and then move those models to the edge for real-time inferencing. The same goes for many other types of services like storage that we'll talk about today um, and other third-party offerings because Microsoft is definitely a partner-centric um, company. It was so really breathtaking how quickly the edge is evolving. And personally, I can't think of a more exciting area in tech to be working. So I'm looking forward to spending the next like 25, 30 minutes talking about this. And I think that comment from one of the one of the listeners was like spot on about data silos. And what's interesting is I think that comment touches on it at a first level with which is silos within one tenant, but then as we try and share data, how do we break apart silos across tenants? Like how do we allow devices from one customer to share data with devices from another customer so that the aggregation of data across companies can help both of them make uh, better decisions? And I think Steve touched on some of those hard issues, right? Like not only is there obvious the obvious security implications, right? Like certain devices need to be authorized to talk to other devices, but there's also business models. Today, many companies rightly look at their data like oil, right? Like data is what you want to collect so you can make better insights, and I want to forward all of my data for myself so that my insights are better than my competitors. However, sharing data across tenants really brings into question how do companies give access to other companies to their data and then revoke that access as well. So things like security, business models are going to be super important as this area evolves. You know, that's an, that's an interesting insight. It's by sharing data, you can get additional insight. The opportunity is for you to get insight off of your data first, but then, but then use that data and other data to be able to gain more insight and to be able to share and grow insight that can be applied back. So there's a, there's a decision that needs to be make, made at every organizational level on when to give up propriety uh, in order to get uh, in order to crowdsource your uh, your information back. Exactly, I think we're just on the beginning of like the beginning of that. Like right now, I think we're in the phase of companies distributing their newfound capabilities to the edge. So leaving the cloud, well, not leaving the cloud, but moving capabilities that sometimes are only constrained to the cloud and augmenting their edge devices with that within their tenant, within their own tenant. But once they sort of complete that pendulum shift, then I think people are going to start looking at, oh, my data only gives me a certain set of insights, but I could augment it by partnering with this other company um, or what have you. And that's going to ha have a bunch of different challenges that need to be solved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there was a there was a comment made by one of the listeners that uh, that I think we we've already covered, but I, I just want to make sure that uh, that we're emphasizing this. You know, the comment from the listener was the app may run on the edge, but the database runs on prem, as an example. But with the distributed stack that you're talking about here, and and with the ability to to use compute resources like Steve was talking about earlier. You can actually run the database anywhere, and you talked about actually making an AI model and distributing that AI model anywhere that you need to to do it. So really, in the end, the there is centralized compute, and there's going to be continued need for you know the, the high performance computing or the or the big AI big AI compute node. But that decision is going to get distributed, and your desire from the Microsoft perspective, and it would be to would be to make that you know I re I I reuse write once run everywhere or I overuse it a little bit, but that's really what you're trying to get to is I've got a model I can distribute that model and and I can and I can gain insight and share insight as necessary, correct? Exactly. Not only do you have the programming paradigms to write once, run everywhere, but Microsoft has 
programming languages and development tools and things like that. So we definitely want to allow developers to write once run anywhere, but also provide products like devices and software for devices that allows customers to size the, the devices that they need based on their scenarios. Um, and I mm -hmm. think I like the term like data has gravity and data has gravity for multiple reasons. Maybe the data is really big and so you can't move it from on premise to the cloud to do inferencing. But maybe data has gravity like Steve mentioned for um, governmental reasons. Like there are restrictions that that mean that this data must remain on premise. For example, personally identifiable data to meet privacy regulations. Yes, yeah, and, and and Steve, I, I was going to say it earlier, but I think I think this is good, and then and then we'll transition over to Ali saying, "Oh, great, I get to implement all of this." But Steve, uh, one of the things that you talked about was geofencing from a data storage perspective. But I would think at some point or another there might be geofencing from a routing perspective as well. I don't want my data running through that particular country, or I don't want my data running through that entity because my data needs to be secured in some way. Have you seen a desire for that in the, in your customer base? Uh, more than a desire, actual requirements. Uh, you know, for example, the GDPR requirements in in uh, Europe uh, are pretty explicit about the, how data can route with uh, from one EU entity or one EU country to another, and where it can't go, and. The same. What's interesting about it, I'm glad you asked it because what's interesting about that is is the same kind of technology that allows you know network infrastructure to to do the tagging of where it's going or where it's coming or doing route decisions by SD WAN capabilities or SDN capabilities locally. That same technology can also be used to help inform the way data it should flow, not just to avoid uh, countries that are uh, considered you know, bad actors, but to direct data based on, its di based on the data as opposed to based on insights into the protocol headers to places where it needs to aggregate. So that this kind of the magic of of AI can occur, whether it's for, you know, sophisticated inference on tens or hundreds or thousands of, of parallel streams or simultaneous streams of data, or um, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to transition a little bit, Ellie. I want to hand it over to you. So you know, uh, you're you're at a startup company. You're uh, you know you're one of the partners that uh, that Chiplo referred to uh, on the Azure side. I want you to talk a little bit about what it's like, uh, you know, staring at the two big industry uh, uh, organizations that we've talked about already, and what it's like to actually turn that into product and deliver valuable insight to your customer base. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jim. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I, my name is Ellie Tjomkin. I'm uh, with NGD Systems. We are a computational storage uh, uh, company. Uh, but today I'm also going to be speaking on behalf of uh, SNIA, the computational storage uh, special interest group. And really when we look at the, uh, the compute uh, infrastructure it is today with relations to network and storage, we see that uh, uh, there is a problem. And the problem as we uh, see a massive increase in uh, data uh, and when we see the need for uh, compute capabilities at the edge and at the cloud, uh, there are some physical problems around volumetric density and, uh, of course, power and scalability. And uh, SNIA had uh, looked at this and decided to do something around computational storage. And there is a technical working group and a special interest group that is looking on uh, how to solve the problem and how to enable uh, computational storage. And what is computational storage? So the concept uh, is not new. The concept of computational storage has been around. It's taking that compute capability and moving it from where it resides today on the host uh, CPU and memory and moving it to the storage. And the major benefit of doing that is 
reduction in data movement. Because if you are able to uh, conduct the compute, uh, execute application container in the storage, then only the essence of that uh, computation is moving back and forth to the host and that the uh, reduction in data movement creates uh, a lot of efficiency from a system perspective. Uh, SNEA is looking at uh, uh, three different definitions of computational storage uh, uh, devices. Uh, the one is, uh, one of them is, is CSD, computational storage drives. The other one is the computational storage processor, the CSPs. And the last one is computational storage array, the CSA. And all basically provide the same type of end result of taking the workload off the host CPU and moving it into either the actual storage, the, the, the storage processor, or the fabric of the storage. And by that, alleviating some of the uh, uh, data movement need between where the data resides in the storage and the host. And, and that really addresses uh, two things, Ellie. It really comes to what Steve was saying earlier about the fact that compute really is everywhere and you're seeing greater and greater compute functions uh, in the storage arrays, even even down to the drive level. But then also uh, what Chivalo was talking about in terms of being able to take a model and distribute it in a variety of ways. And so you can do that at that various layers of scale, right? Yes. And that scalability is is a major point because as data become vast, uh, the, trying to find that uh, the, those needles in a haystack become, is becoming a huge problem. And that's what we're trying to solve. And that's the, uh, you know, the, the goal, either if it's in the data center at the edge or between the edge and the data center, reducing that data movement is going to contribute a lot to efficiency uh, and uh, enabling new applications. So if we if we jump to uh, uh, to some actual examples of uh, deploying computational storage, uh, uh, here is the uh, one of the uh, use cases is as I mentioned finding the needles in a haystack. So you have a data set of images, uh, and this is an example that uh, it was publicly uh, presented at the, at the ACM journal. So the big data set of images that uh, now you're trying to apply image similarity search. So you are uploading a new image and you want a, a reference uh, and see how, uh, what type of uh, other images are closely related to that new image. And the way to do it is usually around, there's a vector in every image describing what's in the image. Uh, so you need to scan the entire data set in order to do that. And the compute infrastructure as it is today require you to move the entire data set back and forth from the storage to the host, which means you need to chop the data into chunks in order to move it, and that's a tedious and painful uh, process. Today in the compute infrastructure, the traditional compute infrastructure, nobody is really measuring the cost of data movement because it's a default. You can either move the entire data from storage to the host to apply computation or run it in in-memory database, which will be very expensive and volatile. So um, adding computational storage to the mix help you uh, deal with a problem. And what we see here is that you have a system with a, only with a host compared to a system with eight computational storage devices or 24 computational storage devices. Loading time is going down dramatically search time is going down dramatically, which leads to a much better performance from a system perspective. Now, usually when you um, increase performance, you pay a power penalty. Here we see the reverse effect. So not only that we were able to uh, increase the, the performance uh, of finding the image similarity or, or applying the image similarity search, the power of uh, while doing it also reduces. And if you think why, it makes completely sense because you're not moving the data in order to scan it. So where you apply computational storage, uh, where the data is in the storage, now you don't need to move it back and forth and you're, redu you're reducing a lot of energy to, uh, to do the same type of uh, computation. Uh, another example that uh, actually 
leads to uh, both what uh, we we heard from uh, uh, in the beginning of the presentation is the edge. So the cloud is really pretty much established as is today, and we uh, we of course see a, uh, expect a big growth in the cloud the infrastructure in the future. But where we really will see a dramatic change is the edge infrastructure. Uh, all those uh, sensors that provide data uh, that will be managed at the edge and screened at the edge uh, will not move all the way to the cloud because of efficiency reasons. So here we have an example of a com edge compute infrastructure. So we have the data coming from the sensors to the edge compute uh, in, in infrastructure. And each one of the storage devices in this uh, edge compute uh, system is a computational storage device. We were able to run the Microsoft uh, IoT Edge on each device and then run an application on top of it that is doing the AI machine learning type of uh, processing. Uh, we ran an example of a computer vision application. So images flow in into the edge compute unit. It's a computational storage device running the Azure IoT Edge, doing the computer vision on the device and recognizing the image and then only the essence of that the application is moved to the cloud for further processing. The majority of the data will not move from the edge compute system to the cloud. And when we look at the infrastructure of edge compute on an island, on an island or network of edge compute systems, now if we're able to run computational storage on those edge compute nodes, and reduce massive data movement between the edge and the cloud, it will allow us to uh, uh, make sense of all that data that is coming in without wasting it or without uh, trying to move the entire data set into the cloud. And by that, uh, you know, wasting a lot of resources in terms of power and efficiency. You know, and Ellie, this is a great example of a question that came through, and it was actually a pretty product-specific question on Azure Stack. Um, and I'll have Chipolo answer that very specific question in the presenter to audience announcements. But let me up-level the question a little bit and, and uh, leading off of this. When do you make the decision to keep the data on-prem uh, and bring the services to it rather than take the data to the to the service itself? What's the... What are I'll ask Ellie first. Um, you know what in this particular instance, what made you desire to keep the data on prem versus move it to a to a centralized computing resource? So the the number one um, you know, reason why is the data should be processed at the edge versus the cloud is when you need to compare that new data that came in to the storage to an existing data set. Right? The data set is now re is still residing in your storage at the edge. Doing that inference at the edge and, and coming up only with the, uh, the essence of, the, of that computation uh, action and you send it back to the cloud reduces you from the, uh, um, from the need to take the entire data set and move it to the cloud. The, the more heavy the images, videos become, uh, the bigger headache it is to move entire data sets to the cloud for uh, for computation, especially when we take latency as something vital for the speed of getting uh, the results back. So when the data is very small, moving it uh, all the way to the cloud and back might work, but when you start dealing with the vast amount of data that is heavy in weight, then latency become a very major consideration, and that's where computational storage can uh, can uh, come handy. So, Chip, I'm going to ask you a similar version of that question. So, when would you want the decision to be made in terms of I want to I want to analyze the data at that portion of of the node or at that or at the edge versus bring it back to the data center? You talked about data gravity, but are there other considerations that would come into that? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, I would echo many of the considerations that have been brought up so far in terms of 
how big is the data? Does it make sense for me to move it from where it is to wherever I need to do that inferencing? Like, is that economically viable? Um, are there regulations that prevent me from doing that? Are there latency requirements that even if I could move the data, I need to respond to the insight from inferencing that data so fast that it doesn't make sense for me to move it away from where that compute is happening? And those are all very specific to the end scenario that the customer is trying to accomplish. So we just try and provide you the tools to create those applications, and then you get to tailor them towards what your specific scenario is. Mm -hmm. And Steve, and Jim, I was going to say I was going to pass it to you, Steve. So why don't you just make your comment? Uh, yeah, I was just going to add, you know, that when we think about um, some of the kinds of decisions that we're, you know, our customers are expecting to make. Uh, based on the, where the da where the data aggregates, some decisions are, you know, on prem decisions where the value uh, of the data, you know, is is uh, ma ma mostly materializes, you know, on prem and making that decision locally. But some decisions are need to be made in the metro area. So, for example, if you're operating multiple retail stores and you're trying to track you know, c customer impressions or doing, you know, uh, digital signage with, uh, you know, uh, auctioning um, time uh, based on, you know, user profiles, et cetera, that are walking into the stores, uh, you have an, a, a metro edge problem that you need to be able to respond to quickly, and but uh, you need to do it in multiple locations. Other examples of metro edge problems are, you know, if you're trying to manage a transportation system or, or a traffic system, um, you know, by its very nature, it's spread out across the metro area. And so the decisions you need to make are based on data that is streaming from across the, the, um, the metro area. So you have a much more distributed environment that you have to deal with. And so you know, I'm just saying that, that um, based on the, the sensing surface, meaning where the sensors are, if they're all on-prem, well, you've got mostly an on-prem problem. If they're scattered all over the, the, the metro area, you've got a metro problem. And the, you know, the whole point of most of these edge implementations, and for that matter, just the whole notion of cloud-native uh, uh, software development for which you know both the network and you know IOT applications are going through this transformation it allows for moving the 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 microservice or the the uh, the application or the service anywhere it needs to be and sometimes that just needs to be in the metro area and sometimes it's best suited on prem you know and and it invites the thing you know back in the back in the old days and you know even today uh, routing means I want to get this bit from uh, from this place to this place as fast as possible. But realistically, when you when you writ large that problem uh, or write large that problem, effectively what we're talking about is intelligent routing. Uh, it's and and that could be a data decision or that could be a you know a byte or or, or cash decision. But effectively, what you're talking about is maybe I want that data somewhere else, but not now, because it would be either painful or involve security issues or other things like that. So so instead of bringing, instead of moving the data where I know I can get the decision, I want to ask that the decision get brought to the data for now, and maybe later I'll move the data to the decision to make larger decisions. Any of the three of you can comment on that. I agree, um, and, and, and what it really represents is data has different value at different times since it was last created and in different locations. And uh, being able to distribute data is not just an act of you know networking, but it's also an act of balancing the uh, the kind of uh, processing needed to make you know extract the insight 
the, whatever that insight is, whether it's a metro level insight or it's a local insight for safety, uh, uh, you know, reasons or et cetera. So all of those factors of latency, jitter, privacy, uh, cost of transport, et cetera, all come into play. And what this really begs is there is a really target rich environment for how do you uh, create an orchestration pr function that m balances the needs of wh where data can efficiently and cheaply be stored, where it can efficiently and cheaply be moved, and where it can efficiently and cheaply be processed, uh, you know, at, measured against all the factors that, of latency, jitter, you know, privacy, uh, uh, resiliency, et cetera. Uh, you know, if somebody's looking for a startup, there's a place to go. Yeah, yeah I love that it's, comment it's, that data has different value at different times. Like if you take the example of like an auto manu manufacturer, they, as they produce a car, they're pulling tons of telemetry about how tightly different screws are torqued and things like that. And at the moment, that data is not as useful as a high-value alert about this robot is about to injure a human. However, they still have to store that data for posterity because when a recall comes or when a car gets in an accident, they may need an audit log to prove that that car was manufactured up to spec. I mean, so I think that's a great example of different times when you need to store data and act on it in different, like, orders of magnitude of time, right? Like a high-value alert you need to act on immediately, whereas if you're auditing production data, that may be years later. Mm -hmm. There was a comment from one of the audiences that that you know takes it a different way. It's a, it's it's kind of a hand grenade. You know, it seems like the simple, albeit not inclusive, answer is to compute at the edge and store in the cloud. Um, can can any uh, can any of you find a reason to refute that? Well, I, mean, I, I think, think it's, you know it's what you want to store and where you need to store it and for how long you need to store it. Um, all data doesn't need to be stored. Um, like you may be able to find your insight immediately and discard it, whereas other information, for example, like we just talked about auditing, may need to be stored for very long amounts of time. And that could go to the cloud that may have to be stored on-prem depending on um, governmental regulations. So mm -hmm. again, I find yeah, that I it often comes down to yeah, these scenarios. It really depends on, on the type of uh, application that you're trying to run and uh, and the importance of the data, right? You have hot, warm, cold data. Uh, you probably want to keep the, most of your cold data in the cloud for economical reasons, and then keep warm and hot data at the edge for some application, and and move the essence of uh, of the data to the cloud for uh, for reference. And I would just add that you know when you're trying to do a improve your training model that you know will ultimately get pushed to your inference engines that you know the, the the complexity of that training model will dictate uh where you can economically do it meaning that if the need is uh it, to, to improve the model is so valuable to move massive amounts of data into the cloud that's what's going to happen it may not be doing that you know modeling uh in real time and probably won't be but i i don't think of the cloud as just a big you know storage array on a long string i don't think it ever will be just that mhm mm you know, and, and this goes to a different question, and then, I, and then I'll answer one more, and then, and then I'll ask one more after that. But it, the question was, how can you move cloud services or cloud models uh, to on-prem? Uh, you know, on-prem might have a large sensitive database. Most of the apps depend on a database, and you can't move the app to the edge computing. So it really comes down to what's the way to take your data models and distribute them to the edge uh, Chip, I'm going I'm to toss that one to you because you talked about it a little bit, but can you give a little more detail on what it's really like to be able to move the model down to de devices or arrays with less and less computing capability? 
Sure. Um, I think that's a great question that sort of touches on where you run compute. So when you train a model, it takes a lot of um, memory and data, right? Like you need a large data set to train that AI model. And the compute necessary to do that in a short amount of time requires likely scalable um, compute resources and scalable memory resources to create a model in some reasonable amount of time. But once you actually have the AI model, you can just feed data through it that is not stored in that original database used to train it. And so once you have the model, you can move that down to, say, the device that's creating that data to get real-time analysis. That doesn't mean that you want to throw away the data that device is creating because you may want to retrain that model in the future. So if you then save the data that the device is creating, move it back to the cloud, or wherever you train that model, maybe you have the high-value AI or ML service in a local data center or somewhere in a metro region, you can then augment that original data set with the new data from the device, retrain the model, and then just push the model, the updated model, again, back down to the original device that was doing the inferences. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to switch gears just a little bit, and, and this will be the question I end. Then there are a couple other questions coming through, and keep submitting them, and we will answer them in the blog. But I thought this was an interesting one. So outside of, we talked about data sharing before and, and gain, you know, gaining insights. And the question was, well, outside of a, a business partnership or a relationship, what other case would users generally agree to share data? Uh, and so just on that, now, now I dare anyone to, to do an answer that doesn't include COVID, um, because I, I think healthcare or other, or pandemic or other things like that is a good answer, but, um, be a little smarter than I am. What are some of the cases where you'd actually say, I have proprietary business information and it would be worthwhile for me to share that to gain additional insight outside of my partnership base? Anyone have a response to that? I've got one use case that I know of personally. Uh, you know, in many, not as a direct relationship to COVID, but as a COVID provider and an accelerant for this use case, and that is seeing the transportation systems, the gridlock, the traffic being reduced, seeing the, you know, the, as we've all worked from home, studied from home, seeing the, the, the cleaner air, cleaner water, et cetera, experience. There are many cities and municipalities across North America and, and, and probably you know, the, around the world are going, hey, we want to keep this. How do we do it? And so part of what I'm seeing is regulations, yes, but actual you know, public money being infused into um, doing collecting data from whether it's reducing the carbon footprint through better building automation techniques of understanding the loading of the building, et cetera, to, to do a better job of heating and cooling or, or, or lighting for safety, et cetera, or it's, you know, coordinating, uh, you know, the, the return of people back to the office to, you know, have a more organized fashion of how traffic will flow in and out of a metro area. You know, so I see public money will be one of those ways that will drive coordination of private data. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're so coming I'll up to the top to of the, the hour. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Quick answer. No, quick okay, answer, yeah, and, then I'll, I'll, and then I'll wrap it up. Awesome. The canonical, like, connected cars driving around streets, and one car breaks so, and it sends out a message to other cars behind it so that they don't crash into each other. I think that's an overused example, but it highlights some of the complexities that we'll have with sharing data, right? Like these different cars are from different manufacturers. Um, the cars have to use a common protocol so that they can share data between them. And then as they share data, they need to redact things like personal, personally identifiable information, like whose car is this, how fast is this one specific person going, and making sure that that doesn't isn't used outside of the scenario for breaking, right? Like it's not been captured and sent back up to the cloud without that person's information. So and, yeah, cars and then is Ford, always a... <laughs> and then Ford and Chevy can tweet back and forth at each other on, on uh, malfunctions and failures. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
So, uh, so a, we did, we are hitting the top of the hour, and I want to be conscious of everyone's time. As as you can see, uh, you know, we've got a lot to talk about, and you and uh, if you're interested in future webcasts, you can comment on that in the feedback section. Please do rate this webcast and provide us with feedback. You can see your feedback button there, and uh, and please rate and give us some ideas of what you'd like to hear in the future. Um, a link to this webcast in the PDF will be at the SNEA Compute Memory and Storage Initiative. Uh, you can basically find it in the SNEA Educational Library. So go to SNEA.org and you can search on Educational Library and you'll find the material immediately and then uh, we'll have a, a webcast and a repeat of this, of this Bright Talk uh, will be available there. And we will post this webcast to the blog. Uh, Chip Lowe, Ellie, Steve, I uh, would really like to thank the three of you for participating, and we'd like to thank you, the audience, for listening. We hope everyone has a great day, and we look forward to talking to you on a future webcast. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.